this is a workshop. Okay, I'm going to talk for a while. We're going to just, you know, I'll take questions. I'm going to give you some ideas. But then I'm going to turn it over to you. And we may not need the full hour and a half. So we'll just see how it goes. But I'm certainly happy to keep the discussion going as long as you all want to do that. So praying in public. What is that like? Have any of you had the opportunity to do that in a big group or, you know, like a meeting besides outside the church, outside yeah. of our church? Yeah, you've had, you've yeah. had opportunities to do Invocations for city council. Exactly. Okay. Good. Because the invocations, one of the things we're going to talk about. You don't mean silent prayer. Uh, no, no. Or We've all done that outside of church. <laughs> different meetings. I mean, um, actually uh, giving a prayer. Okay. Either that you have prepared ahead of time, mm -hmm. or that you are doing well, this is spur of the moment. Maybe this will help. That's good. Okay. So there are various occasions where you may be called. Um, Dick, you will need a handout. Douglas has some to share. It's, it's just a one pager. All right. Um, so the first thing you're going to consider, because if you've been called on to pray, it's always nice when you know ahead of time. Um, and, you know, I've done this, my husband has done this for a whole career. He's really good at it. I was very shy about doing it until really probably just about a year ago. And then I've gotten more and more practice. And that's all it takes is having an understanding of what's really important and then practicing that. Okay, so one of the first questions you'll ask, if you're asked to pray, is what's the occasion? Uh, is it a worship service? Is it a banquet? Is it a luncheon? Is it a family function? <coughs> is it just among friends? I mean, you will cater your style, I'm sure, and your message to the group that you're talking about. So the next question you might want to ask is, who are these people that are going to be there, and what would they be comfortable with? Is this a group that you sense is religiously involved? Do, are they church people? Do they attend church? Do they have a sense of being religious? And it may be that you can't know that. But if you know some of the people in the group, then you might have a sense of that. If it's a safety council meeting or a you know, government type of meeting, you might make the assumption that you might you might make the assumption that um, I will make it very generic, and it can still be deep and generic, but you might want to do it that way. All right. So the next. Is it a blessing? Are you just being asked to bless uh, the meal that, that you're going, or the, the reason that you're together, um, acknowledging that this is a blessing to be together with everyone who's here. So let's celebrate that. Maybe that's going to be your message. Uh, <coughs> is the, oh, the second question in the, in the uh, who people are present, are they Christian? Do you know that? Or is it in their faith? And you will, you know, work your comments um, depending on that. And then the, another question is, what's the age range? That sometimes makes it, makes a difference in, in who's attending and what their expectations of background might be. All right. So types of prayers, invocation. That's where you're invoking the presence of the holy into the gathering where you are. My husband was often called on as a chaplain to give the invocation at banquets. Dining in, as they're called, or dining out. Dining out means you get to bring your spouses. Dining in is all just the military people. Uh, and so an invocation is where you invite God or the Holy Spirit or divine love to be present at this gathering. 
that may be the way you sort of get into the message that you have to give. Then the blessing. Um, if you've been asked to do a blessing, acknowledge that it's a blessing to all be together. And that that blessing isn't going to just stay within that room. It can go out and meet the needs of everybody in that community, everybody in that city, everybody, you know, you can, you can uh, decide on the scope of what you want to address. And then another uh, form of prayer is pastoral prayer. <clears throat> and that's where um, you're asking God to be aware of everyone's needs and to be present with them. And as, you know, giving a pastoral prayer, it's a prayer of care is what its focus is. And you're caring for the group that you're you know, praying with. So, <coughs> I have one, actually. I brought the one on the last one I wrote. I thought you might like to hear it um, to give you a sense of, you know, my husband and I both uh, volunteered to give a pastoral prayer. We both have Masters of Divinity degrees um, and you know, we've been asked by the, uh, the Congregational Church to give a pastoral prayer. And this happens in the middle of the service. And so uh, what we would do, now currently, they're running a series called Animated Faith. And what that is, it's um, getting people used to the idea of looking for the sacred in the secular. Now, last year, they did Gospel on Broadway, and they did a whole series of Broadway plays in looking for the divine messages that you can get from that kind of creative experience. Well, this time, it's Disney animated films. <laughs> and I'm actually giving the sermon on August 13th, and I've chosen to, to do Moana. So if you haven't seen Moana, I love it. <laughs> Love the music, um, but I will say I'm having trouble narrowing it down because it is full of spiritual messages. All right, so when it's time for the pastoral prayer, we would walk up to the central table where there's a podium and the Bible's on the table and the cross is on the table and the flowers are on the table. And uh, what I always say is, good morning. Would you please pray with me? We come together as a community to worship you and celebrate each other. <clears throat> our focus this summer is to discover ways to animate our faith. We are seeking a resilient faith expressed in more animated loving, more animated caring, and more animated sharing. We ask you to help us learn to love our neighbors better especially the ones we don't particularly like. We ask that we feel your love for your creation all around us, be it through song, sermon, or science. <laughs> we, seek, we seek to see you in secular expressions of creativity. May they serve to spark our own theological imagination. We turn our prayers to the Ukrainians who have just passed 500 days of war. May they feel hope from you as they soldier on in their fight for freedom. We embrace those families who have experienced the loss of loved ones through the mass shootings that have happened recently, and also those who are reliving the losses of their loved ones as the shooters are now being tried in the courts. God. I am so grateful I heard this week about Yusuf Salam, one of the Central Park Five. Yusuf was wrongly imprisoned for seven years. He was 14 years old at the time for a murder he didn't commit. He said recently that one of the things he has learned is what happens to you happens for you. He said that for him, his experience in prison helped him improve his peripheral vision to see more clearly what is going on around him. He's just now been, uh, won a primary for the New York City Council. 
In prison, Yusuf read the story of Jacob's son, Joseph. Notice the same name. In the Quran, and it's also in the Bible. Joseph was wrongly imprisoned and later became one of the most powerful men in Egypt. This story animated his faith and gave him hope. I pray we all can catch a glimpse of some aspect of your grace in such a powerful way sometime in our lives. And finally, God, what is up with this weather? <laughs> we ask your mercy for those who are feeling like they are living in a fiery furnace. May they find relief from the heat, and may we all wake up and do our part to help repair the damage that has been done to our atmosphere. We ask for guidance for our politicians as we move into the season of re-elections, and ask for guidance or for patience as we are bombarded with opposing views of truth. There are those in our community who have asked for special prayers. Their names will be on the screen. So then they have a rolling screen of names of people in the community who have asked for prayer from the community. So we watch that. And then we end with our creator, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Okay, that's a fairly typical. What's that word you're using instead of kingdom? Kingdom. kingdom. Yes. Spell kingdom that? here. Uh, oh. Yes. Um, I didn't change it there. But in this particular church, the preference is to use the word kingdom. Well, this is the congregation. This is the congregational church. And the idea is that we are siblings in Christ. It is not hierarchical. We are equal in the eyes of Christ. We are all kin. We are all related. So it is a, an intentional um, decision to try and dismantle empire, if you will, uh, and colonialism and, you know, all of that type of hierarchical power structure, okay? So, um, yeah, so what did you notice in there? Anything in particular stand out to you? <laughs> Staying right here for a little while. Well, I noticed you used the word animated a lot at yes. the beginning. I'm not sure I understand what that meaning is. Does that mean brought to life? Or? That's a, yes, exactly. Something and that's like what that. animation is. It's, okay. it's taking a drawing and bringing it to life. Right. I mean, in that context of those movies. Yeah. But yes, to animate something is to, you know, have it express yeah. life. Okay. Enliven it. <clears throat> yes. It seemed like you, you were relating it to the topic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You might not have yeah. picked up on that. Okay. That could yes, I, I related it and and the week that I did this was the kickoff of the product of, of the theme, okay. and we had two banners um, hanging on either side that said animated faith with a graphic uh, symbolism uh, graphic in the middle, and uh, so it was reinforcing what we were going to be talking about, so uh, that was intentional. What else did you notice? Anything? I noticed that you put uh, that you mentioned um, somebody specifically that had been incarcerated wrong. Yes, and one of the challenges of uh, and I weighed whether or not to put that in there, but I know this congregation, and I know that what they hang on is social justice. It's very important to them, and this idea that what happens to you happens for you would hit home yes. with them. But the problem with asking pastors to take to do a pastoral prayer is if they're, they'll turn it into a preaching opportunity. You know, it, it just happens and, and then it gets too long and that's not the purpose, but it was short and I knew the message would hit home. Yes. So I did put it in. 
Anything else that you noticed? Great. We included a lot. Anybody would feel like they had an identification with the prayer because you had the ingredients, <coughs> you had the climate, you had so many different aspects of prayer that something that was topical was included in the prayer that they might be looking for. Yes, and these people are passionate. Um, they, they often have their particular area that they're passionate about. And so trying to, you know, relate it to all of those was intentional. Anything else that you noticed? You were speaking, I believe, to God <coughs> on their behalf. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what public prayer is about. It is speaking to God. It is a conversation with God with others listening in. Thank you for catching that. Absolutely. Yeah. I was just going to echo that because that, to my experience, is the thing that often seems not as present in the way we, we would pray because we would affirm things about God mm -hmm. rather than addressing God. Mm -hmm. And you look at Miss A's hymns, Shepherd, show me how to go. And this, this idea of talking to God. The only other thing I was going to say, Jerry, by the way, designed those banners that are hanging oh. at the front oh, of the church. church. <laughs> and um, it's fascinating. That this past Sunday, it was the um, the animated film was Pinocchio, oh. and it was fascinating to see what got lifted up, which is also a progressive Christian theme. The song "I've Got No Strings on Me." <laughs> it was unpacked by the pastor mas masterfully as the idea a lot of us think that God is has a plan we always say things something bad happened well God must have had a plan or we think that they're like we're puppets and there's a puppeteer pulling on the strings yeah, the, the holy puppet master the holy puppet master <laughs> and dissolving that began saying that's, that's not really the truth that you know, we're, they're discovering who we are, and that Pinocchio's journey um, is to become a real boy. Um, and it gets back to the creator, Geppetto, doesn't want a perfect toy. He wants a real son. And what's part of the realness? Making choices, you know, letting go. I, I just thought it was really interesting way of inducing some real theology in it, which is a really, really helpful way to see it talked about. And anyway, I thought Jerry's prayer was excellent. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that yeah, stood that out for me was your soft landing on when you were praying about the political season, and uh, it, I think you expressed it like our different opinions of the truth. Yes, yeah, different yeah, versions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, yeah like, <laughs> And give us patience to deal with that. And that's what we all can do, is have patience. Because we're presented with things that just infuriate us. It's like, how could you believe that? How could you possibly think that was true? And just because you say it doesn't make it so. You know, and so we could just get really wrapped around the axle for this <laughs> entire political, you know, series that we're getting ready to move into. And... We need patience. We need to have a better perspective. Yeah, so thank you for anything else that you noticed. Song, sermon, or science? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and your dance. And I, well, I didn't dance on yeah, the I, I did, because you all resonated with it. The rest, you know, didn't know. He knew where it came from. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious about, you said the number of people that had called in or written in. Yes, that ask for, yes, they have a, a prayer um, list of people that, that they, every week, put on the screen. Oh, it's on the screen. Uh-huh, okay. they, they have, um, there's a, the, a real pulpit um, off to the side, and then there's a table in the middle, which is kind of like the altar. Uh, and so usually in the first service, which is a little more formal, she, the pastor preaches from the pulpit. Uh, but the prayer and her welcome and all the rest take place in the middle of the room in the, at, at, the, at the table. Um, and why I've lost my train of thought. Is it different every week or is it the same 
same number of people or the same people? Oh, on the pair pair list. Um, yeah, it, it's the same people until they ask to be removed or pass on. You know, it's. Uh, it might just be a relationship problem or whatever. Exactly. But they might not yeah. pass on. No, and then they may say, okay, I'm good. You know, one of the interns, we, we employ four, uh, three interns from Cal State Fullerton. And I'll tell you, their, their music program is off the charts. Wonderful. Our director is also from there, um, our music director. And uh, the, the talent is, is unbelievable. But one of the women had to have knee surgery. So she was on the prayer list for, for quite a while while she's still recovering from that. People might be putting on the name of their sister who's having surgery this mm -hmm. week, or of a child who's just been diagnosed as um, ADD or something like that. You know, you, you make requests for others. And that gets back to what we were it was talked about last week about how you stand witness about how you're beholding mm -hmm. that person. It's what we do in silent prayer, but it's names are expressed and people feel counted. They feel seen. And a lot of times they mm -hmm. want to they feel that. And the one who people care about them want to feel that. And they don't put what's wrong. Right. There's nothing on there but a name. So. Well, I had gone to my mom's church in Prescott, Arizona. This was a number of years ago. I believe it was a congregational church. And uh, <clears throat> I think my mom stood up and did some type of prayer for the congregation. It was a very small congregation. And then whoever was doing the service, uh, there was they read out loud the number of folks who were hoping mm -hmm. for the prayer of support. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it was interesting that that's still, not that it's still happening, but wondering in what way it was delivered. Well, and different churches different, do it different ways. Both of the services, because the um, 1115 service is a little less formal, more praise music, more uh, interactive. Uh, she, the preacher does not preach from the pulpit. They bring the table down to the floor, and she preaches from there. So it's designed to be, um, this, this church is interested in reaching evangelical people who have outgrown the boundaries of their evangelical teachings. And they want a place to land <laughs> that where they feel welcomed. And so that service is really geared a little bit more to a service that they will feel comfortable in. But a lot of our other people like it too. So um, it, it is, you know, it is working. But for that service, the assistant pastor does the prayer. And uh, while the names are scrolling, he also invites people in the audience who have someone they want to mention or uh, an issue they want to pray for to just speak it out. And that's the way um, UCC churches often will do that. It's different, yeah. Is it appropriate to ask how you all found this church? Uh, yes, um, because I, I looked for UCC churches once before, several years before we moved out here. And I couldn't find one because they didn't call themselves UCC. Uh, they had names attached. And I look on the website, couldn't find any, any affiliation. So when we actually moved, knew we were moving out here, I Googled progressive Christian um, churches. And I used to see popped right up. I don't know where it was before because they've been around for 30 years. But they, I guess, had changed their verbiage. And that's, you Google found them. And so that's how we connected and uh, yeah. They're known as IUCC, but they've changed that first C to congregational, which is really their roots. The UCC church is essentially, most mostly, the old congregational church that Mississippi belonged to. So it's United Congregational Church. That's part of the UCC denomination. Which is United Churches of Christ. Right. Okay. Yes. And there are churches of Christ, which tend to be very conservative. Some, one whole branch of them is non-instrumental, right. which means they don't use any, boy, their harmonies and voices, though, are unbelievable. <laughs> so it's lovely, but they don't believe in using music, their instruments in their services. And so they weren't be confused.
So they changed to the Congregational Church, which we had is distinctive. We had without music in the mm -hmm. little community of 350 people in Randall, Oklahoma, and they could sing. Oh, it's fabulous. amazing, yes, yeah. But, but theology's pretty <laughs> cut and dry. Yeah, Fanny. Jerry, um, the difference between your prayer and the way Christian science scientists typically pray, was it focused more on requesting, would mm -hmm. that be accurate? Whereas mainly I think our prayers are affirmation. Yes. They true? are largely. Yes. We are very we that are very makes comfortable. It for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yes, but it makes it more um, inviting for others. Mm -hmm. the, that, that, have, that resonates with what's in their hearts often. Yeah, because they're that. thinking about Ukraine. They're thinking about the weather. How can you not be thinking about this weather? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, uh, yeah. So I, we always try and include some, uh, and, and when I gave this, it was a time when these Poor parents of these kids in Idaho who had been slaughtered were having to face this guy in court. And then there was another, I don't remember which court cases, a couple of them going on at the same time. So these parents are having to be in that arena again and again. And so I wanted to acknowledge that. So well, that's very compassionate. But as you've mentioned numerous times, I mean in the Lord's Prayer, it has it has requested it, yes. Every single word of the Lord's Prayer. Yes. This is day, our daily bread. And if you listen to what we talked about last week, um, the last little finger I, I put in was petition. And my, I, that is a much stronger piece or type of prayer than we have tended to acknowledge it as being. Um, and one of the reasons is because Articulating what we think we want opens us up to sort of realizing, um, yeah, you know, maybe that's not what I really want. Maybe I'm really needing this. But actually articulating it is taking some kind of an action with it. Mm -hmm. And then we can pivot if we need to. Or maybe that's what we really want. Or maybe we're asking for the Mercedes when we really need a Volkswagen. You know, so it's, <laughs> it's usually the case. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. For me, one way it's been helpful for me with it is, do you remember the old SLR cameras where you had to open yeah. you know, the aperture? Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think we're trying to convince God to do something. <laughs> I think every word we say is like opening an aperture on our hearts. Mm -hmm. So we're more ready to receive God's goodness. Mm -hmm. And I think our, our petitionary prayer can really do that in a, in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Especially when you feel people, a group of people doing it together and they feel in common cause. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. And I would concur with that. Yeah. There's groups that use the I am for affirmations. I am is the name of God. Mm -hmm. I am the way, mm -hmm. I am the truth, I am the life, and then it goes on and on. You can create your own I am's if yes. you like. But I like that because there's a oneness with the person who's giving the prayer and God. Mm -hmm. And that's our goal anyway, mm -hmm. to experience that oneness and make that connection very clearly through an affirmation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very effective way to pray. It would be interesting. Um, yes, and I used to have an I am journal. And I had every page had a, I didn't yeah. get very far with it, but I had good intentions. Um, so every page was a different letter, like all A words, B words. <laughs> and that's so, and, but I, I, I started it. And um, yes, but I'm not aware of, I've never heard anybody do that in a public prayer. Oh. I'm not saying it couldn't be done. Well, but there, it, it there, would there's land group, interestingly. There's a group. Yeah, well, and if that, that group does likes it that, publicly, that's great. Audibly, publicly together. Good, wonderful. I think Love that's it. effective. 
I, it can, yes, yes a obviously. Community. What a way to bond the community. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, a few more things to consider. And this is what I, I feel like I'm kind of throwing a lot at you, but uh, it's important that we, you become aware of some of these things, and then you're going to have a chance to do your thing with it. All right, so one of the things to consider is how biblically literate is the group you're talking to. And you cannot make the assumption that the public is biblically literate. You just can't. It's not taught in schools unless you go to a private school, possibly. Uh, so if you try to use scripture as authority, people who don't know their stories won't see the authority. So whenever I include, I mean, I had to put in there that um, the story of Joseph, Joseph is both in the Quran and in the Bible. And that he became, I couldn't just mention Joseph and, and have people fill in the blanks of that story. So I had to um, speak out about what the point was. And the point was he started being wrongly accused and in prison and then um, became one of the most powerful people in Egypt and blessed a whole kingdom, you know. But I have to put that in there because I can't assume, even in that church, that people know these Bible stories. All right, and not only that, but there are a lot of people, especially in the LGBTQ community, that have been wounded by the misuse of the Bible. And so you can't assume um, you, you need to kind of gently lead to a biblical connection rather than just putting it out there and thinking somebody's going to grasp onto it and find it inspirational. Just saying, it's something to be aware of. This is also true about using Mary Baker Eddy quotes. We have given Mrs. Eddy authority in our lives. We follow her. We're, uh, you know, we study her writings. We, um, we have given her a sense of authority in our lives. But just throwing out a quote in a group is not going to carry that same authority. So be aware of that. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't quote Mary Baker Eddy in other uh, settings. My favorite term is Mary Baker Eddy, a 19th century theologian that I follow. That gives her my you know, endorsement, and this is what she says. But I let what she says be the authority in the quote. I don't throw it out there as though the fact that I'm quoting her carries extra weight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So, and honestly, we do that with each other, often without really unpacking what she's getting at. So that's something we should be working on with all of us, you know, making sure that we're really, um, if, if possible, uh, using our own words to, um, explain our inspiration about what Mrs. Eddy has said instead of just using her words. Yeah. When you use that phrase, the, the song, sermon, or science, does your congregation know what that science refers to? No. Oh, okay. No, they had no way of knowing, but there are a number of those people who are more oriented to science, with a small s, than they are... Uh, the song or sermon. Well, right, religion. You know, they're more they're more science. -oriented. This is a very highly educated group of people in Irvine, and um, and so a lot of them are very invested in science. And so I knew that would work in that setting, even though they didn't know it was a capital S. <laughs> but it had a nice alliteration. <laughs> That's what I liked. So I used it. I was going to make one reference to was when. Jerry talked about referring to Mrs. Eddy. Sometimes Christian scientists have been shocked when Christian science authors, particularly about the academic or scholarly history, just call her Eddy. Mm -hmm. Feel like that's not respectful. Until you listen, Lutherans don't refer, refer to um, Reverend King, or rather Reverend Luther. They don't talk about uh, Dr. Wesley, 
They just call him Wesley. They just call him Luther. Yeah. So when we do something different, there begins part of the thing that we think Mrs. Eddie is equal to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That somehow we've treated her differently than others would treat an academic mm -hmm. or an authority. And I, I just want to let you know it isn't necessarily because they dissed Mrs. Eddie, but because that's the way that they're talked to by in, in scholarly writings, so right. they don't want their stuff tossed out. Because then, they, then they begin thinking, "Geez, that person keeps calling this person Mrs. Eddie. Uh, they must be deferring to her and being her mouthpiece and being prejudiced to her and not treating her independently." Well, just just like you know, we don't say Dr. Albert Einstein. We just say Einstein. Einstein, exactly. And then more yeah. people are going to now be saying Oppenheimer instead of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. so. That's right. David, David had his David had his hand up. Yeah, I did, but I didn't talk about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, is there a way to quote Mary Baker Reddy without saying the quoting Mary Baker Reddy? Because that's what I would rather do, is just say the sentence or thought rather than making it this person said. Because then you're giving some other quality than just God and man. It's just a feeling. Yeah, I, I, um, I, that's interesting, David, and I, and I can resonate with what you're saying. It depends on where you're talking. If you're, if you're presenting someone else's words as your own, that's not usually considered ethical. However, if in just talking to someone and you want to borrow that phrase, then I would say go for it. And if they ask, oh, that's interesting, where did you find, you know, did, did you, is that your idea? Then you can go further, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Chris. In the in offering prayers today, one of the, I, I had grammar so hammered into me. I have so much trouble with the shift in pronouns. Okay, today. this is where I'm headed. Okay. <laughs> You're a precinct here. <laughs> Okay, so here's the next one, and this is the sticky wicket. Um, pronouns. In progressive circles, ungendering God is important. I can't say that any more clearly. If you're going to pray in a setting with progressive Christians, uh, some will not hear you well if you keep using he, 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 and if you use mankind. Did you use the word? Mankind. We have all made peace with using mankind as a generic term for humankind. Listen to the difference. Humankind, that's everybody. Mankind in today's world does not land well Especially, especially with women, but not just women, okay? Young people. Young people, and that's why I was asking earlier, what's the age range of the people that you're talking to? Because they will more likely uh, not be happy, with the exception. If you're talking to an evangelical group, I want to shake your hand that they actually asked you to pray in their group. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> and number two, they are very happy with he. If it's an evangelical group, you can use what we're used to. But we've made peace with that, and we've grown up with that. We have been trained to translate that to mean everybody, men and women, trans people, you know, gay people, <laughs> questioning people. Everybody, humankind. So, what can you do about it without getting tied in knots? Because one is you just use the word God, and it sounds weird at first. Um, God is in charge of God's creation. God is in charge of His creation. Well, that's the way we would usually say it. But you can just say God is in charge of God's creation. God self. God self. Yes. I mean, there are ways to work around it. Um, I just want to let you know that is an issue. That is a flag issue. 
if you're giving a talk. So you can find ways around it. You'll notice, I don't know if you noticed it, you, there was no he in the prayer I read, and that was a fairly lengthy prayer. So I addressed God correct, uh, directly. You know, well, you know, God, what is up with this weather? Um, be with us, God, as we, you know, my favorite reference to God is Holy Creator. I start almost all of my prayers with Holy Creator. We are gathered here together on this Sunday morning, again, to celebrate being with you and being with each other. That brings everybody into the conversation, doesn't leave, any, doesn't leave anybody on the side of the road. Um, so, uh, if you need to use a pronoun, you can always vary them. Use he one place, she another. Uh, you can um, use he for, you know, I would say always use he for Jesus. There doesn't seem to be any concern about that. If you're talking about wisdom, use she. Sophia is wisdom, and that's a she. All right, so um, just so you know that. Um, Can I pick up one bridge yeah, here? Yeah, go for it. Just to, to the, illustrate what she was saying about the conservative group, I just got asked by a retirement community in Irvine if I would be in rotation to offer their Sunday Vespers, which is kind of a high church. It's not an evangelical phrase. But the one woman who was lining up these preachers, when she called me, she's very conservative. And um, I wasn't prepared for that because the person who told me that she, that she had mentioned my name to this woman um, told me it was a pretty diverse audience. But her first words were about um, what's, what's your state of the faith? And then as if I, what, she thought I might not be clear about what she was asking, she says, do you take the Bible as, in, as the infallible, uh, literal word of God? And I said, no, I don't. I take it as the inspired word of God. But the word of God is Jesus Christ, as according to the Gospel of John. But what I did do was kind of the reverse of what Jerry was saying. I start, I, I, for me, this was, you could do it if, according to what authors you've read, maybe, or such. I know you've read a number of authors that might translate to people, Doug. And for me, I started talking about some people I'd worked with when I was doing religious broadcasting who were major conservative Christian. And as soon as I mentioned two of them, she was on my side. <laughs> oh, that means you must be okay. Yeah, Dr. Kennedy, he's Dr. Right. Kennedy. And Dr. Dobson, he's good. <laughs> Name dropping. <laughs> So that, that opens up to another thing, and, and I had a conversation with someone last week about this. If you run into someone who wants to have a conversation with you about specific um, aspects of faith, I highly recommend you set boundaries from the beginning. And here's the boundary. I am so happy to have a conversation with you about that. I love talking about faith, and I love hearing about what your faith means to you. I will have a dialogue with you, but I will not have a debate, all right? And you set that boundary, and the difference is so you're clear. A debate is somebody's trying to win. A dialogue is a sharing. And even if you start down that road with them, here's the thing. Some people truly believe that their salvation is tied to how many people they bring to Christ to think like they do, all right? So the motivation you might be, you know, um, may not be rational, the motivation that they're coming to you with. Uh, so just be aware of that. And you may just have to say, you know what, I've enjoyed this at this point but I don't think I need to continue anymore, or I don't think you're listening to me, or whatever it is comes to you to say, but cut it off. Um, otherwise, you'll just keep going like this and this and this. Um, so another thing you can do, and I highly recommend this, is you uh, use I statements when you're talking about, and then encourage them, and they won't know you're doing this, if you do it skillfully, Encourage them to use I statements because you can say things like, um, so, okay, well, let me give you a graphic first. 
an image, a wagon wheel. It's called the mandala. All right, so think of about a wagon wheel, old-fashioned wagon wheel, with a hub in the center and a rim on the outer edge and uh, spokes going back and forth. All right, so we're all on individual spokes going back and forth in our daily experience. The rim is the world, the hub is God. So you'll notice the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. The more you talk about the reading room drape color and the carpet, the more you're talking about the worldly things, the further you get from each other. All right, so keep your, your conversation centered more in the center of the hub. So if they say something like, um, you know, being saved, when, when, I, when I accepted Jesus, my whole life changed, and I pray every day, and so I could ask that person a question like, so how does your prayer help you feel closer to God? Explain that to me. You know, let, you know, and then you can pick up on some bridge that you might be able to build. Or you could say something like, I can hear how important it is to you that, um, that this is the blood of Jesus. I, you've mentioned that several times. Tell me what that does for you. In, in helping you build your faith. And then listen and let them talk. And they may not be at all interested in what you have to say, but you know, we can learn and we need to be willing to learn from other people. You will run into people with great faith who you would never suspect. And if you don't sit and listen to them, you'll never, you'll never have that encounter. Okay, so we need to get away from this idea that the whole world is supposed to come to us. Yeah, there needs to be mutuality. One thing I will say is that I've heard this from a number of people at the church. They'll come up to us individually after he prays or, uh, or after I pray, and sometimes after he prays, they'll come to me. <laughs> and they'll say, I just love listening to your husband and you when you give the prayer because you believe what you're saying. <laughs> and I feel that, you know. So, yeah. Being authentic about what you're praying in a situation, the heart will speak. And those who have hearts will listen, okay? <laughs> I know you've heard that before. All right, so how do you begin a prayer? How do you begin to write a prayer? Well, I'm just giving you lots of things, all the minefield, to, to be careful about. And I think I told you the first week. Um, we actually invited my, our, our Brentwood Christian Science Church in St. Louis, uh, invited one of the professors that I had. Uh, he was the guy in charge of the chapel worship. Wonderful guy, played the guitar, loved him. Uh, and we invited him to come and give us a workshop on how to pray out loud because we hadn't, you know, we didn't know how to do that. And so um, he was very happy to come and do that. It was great. Uh, and he's the one that gave me the little format that we're going to use later. But um, he said, well, you just stand up there and you look at them and you say, oh, my God. <laughs> and you're off and running. <laughs> And you know, there's, there's wisdom in that. Because once you get started, if you're used to having conversations with God, you can do this. You can do this, and you can pause to collect your thoughts. You don't have to give a polished prayer. If you have some warning and you can prepare a, a prayer ahead of time, great. But you can also just include, go into your closet, if you will, and I did actually bring this from Matthew. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be at the, as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the street. And this is the key part. This is the where they get off track, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, 
for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. It's not the words, it's the heart. Go into your closet. And if you don't do this at home, I recommend trying it. Talk out, my first healing as an adult, I was fresh out of college, happened because I actually talked out loud to God for the very first time. I was rolling around, he was gone, I was rolling around on the floor in pain, and I thought, what am I gonna do? And I realized if he was there, I would just talk to him. So I thought, okay, I've been in Sunday school forever. I believe God is here, I think. If, if I do, why not just talk? And I did. And that's what broke that particular spell. But yeah, yeah, practice that. The Jews do it all the time, if you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Tevye is always having conversations with God, and they push back. Yeah, so there you go. Um, so if you're ever called on to, to give a prayer, think about it. Just, you know, if you know, especially if you know the group. But if you have to pause a minute to collect your thoughts, that's perfectly fine. And then start with, dear God, and then just keep going. And whatever comes to you. And um, I have given you on your handout, which we'll look at in just a minute, uh, some phrases that you can also um, commit to memory. So basically you're having a conversation with God and other people are overhearing it. So let's see. Jerry, are you having it in behalf of the other people? Yes. Yes, it's, it's a group thing. Otherwise, you could just be, you know, having silent prayer all together at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, praying together, praying in public is really acknowledging that there's a worthwhile reason that you're all together. And you're experiencing <coughs> this together, and it's a bonding opportunity. Yeah. So, let's look at the handout. This is a very old, and it's not collect, it is a collect. It is Latin. Really? Yes. The, your handout that was on your table. Yes, it, it looks like collect. It's not. It's a collect. It's been used for years and years and years, uh, which means it predates Protestantism. So it came from the, the, the main church at that, that time. I superimposed in this format the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's not perfectly done, it doesn't fit perfectly, but you can kind of get a sense of how these lines in the prayer Jesus taught us fit into this. So you start with an address. Holy Creator, Our Father. Now, another thing to be aware of, there are more and more groups, that, especially progressive groups, that acknowledge that Father and Mother, Father, Mother, God. You know, that, we, they say that in, in our church all the time. Um, and they're very comfortable with that. Not everybody has had a good relationship with their parents. So do not just assume that we'll reach everybody. I have a good trans friend who sings in the choir with me whose parents have absolutely disowned her. Absolutely have nothing to do with her. And she, we were singing a song on Mother's Day. We were preparing for Mother's Day. And I'm telling you, uh, it was kind of too sickly sweet for me. And I had a really good relationship with my mother. So it was extremely idealistic. And um, so Alyssa got up and walked out. And I thought she had to go to the bathroom. But then I realized she's pacing in the lobby. And so when she came back in, I, I just turned around. And I said, are you OK? And she said, no. And I said, I'm so sorry. Because here we are singing this sickly song about sweet song about motherhood which didn't fit into her experience and so you know I talked to her a little bit more after and I, I brought that up in the prayer I am the designated prayer for the choir after the um, rehearsals and so I addressed it in the prayer to remember not everybody that will be in church on Sunday will have had a good relationship with their mother so be compassionate reach out and remember that that may be the case, and the courage it takes for them to come to this service on Mother's Day or Father's Day. So anyway, just, just something else to be aware of. But
But in this case, our Father, which art in heaven, is the address. Hallowed be thy name, the attribution. Now, to know more about what those, we'll, go, we'll turn it over and we'll look at more of those. Don't, don't do it now. We're going to keep going. Petition. All right. Thy kingdom come. It's a request that God's kingdom, it's also an affirmation, that God's kingdom is here. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then the purpose. Forgive us our debts so we can forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then the closing. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's flip it over. Look at the other side. So the address. Address your prayer to God. Not the people who are listening. You're talking to God. What aspect, what aspect of God's nature is relevant to the purpose of this prayer? You know, what, what a... If you're addressing an ecology group, you might want to call God by a name that talks about the creator of, you know, all the creatures and all the earth and the balance of the earth and whatever. So, you know, you can cater that to the group you're talking to. Um, think about who you're praying with. What name for God would be acceptable or inspirational? Gracious God, Father, Mother God, Holy Creator, Almighty and ever-living God, or Almighty or an ever-loving God. Okay, those are all very um, acceptable or, or inclusive um, and slightly different ways of addressing God. So those are just some suggestions to get you thinking, because you can come up with your own. So attribution. Sometimes the attribution is based on scripture or phrases that emphasize, some, emphasize something God does. The giver of all good. So, holy creator, the giver of all good, you cover us with your wings. This is the attribution. The petition. What are you asking for? Is it a grace? Is it before a meeting? Bless us today as we partake of this lovingly prepared feast. Be with those who need to feel your love today. I stole one from my husband. Uh, oh, it's in, the next, it's in the next one. Free us from the stress of this busy season. Whatever it is that you would like that group to be at comfort, you know, at comfort about. Um, purpose, why are you asking? That we may be strengthened as a family and community. That we may be able to serve you better. That our time together will serve you well. And this is the one I stole. Bless this food and the time we spend together that we may be nourished by both. He often will give that, you know, when the family's all around, we're waiting, you know, getting ready to sit down to dinner. And then the closing, we ask this through Christ. We ask this in the name of Jesus. I think he talked about when he used to do his performance reports in the Air Force, they often, <laughs> the commanding officer would have you fill out your own performance report or if you were requesting something, you would, you would fill it out and then take it to that person for approval. So whatever you asked for needed to be consistent with what that commander would approve of. So that's one way you can think about this in the name of Jesus is like it's, it's, it's saying, you know, Jesus would approve <laughs> of what we're asking for here. Okay, and that's a very familiar one. People will, if it's a Christian group. Um, they would uh, they would be comfortable with that through the authority of your divine love that works in your name we pray that's often what I'll use on Thursday nights at choir in your name we pray these things all right so here's your assignment <laughs> should you choose to accept it um, we have uh, about a half an hour left uh, and I'm hoping you will take and I'm here to answer questions. You can work as a group. Um, so uh, you can decide what group you're talking to. I had some ideas. Is it a large group? No. Is it a small group? Is it a family group? Is it your bunko group? Okay, how many of you played bunko? Nobody's played bunko? Oh, it's a good game. 
um, an interfaith discussion group, because you'll use different language, uh, the Toastmasters group, um, a ministerial group in your local town. So decide who are you going to write this prayer to or for, and uh, you can work on this uh, individually, or you can partner up, or you can work as a table. But if you work as a table or you don't work by yourself, please, both of you, write it down so when you go home, you have it to reflect back on it and realize you participated in that. Okay? If you want to have fun with one, um, one of the most interesting ones I worked with was when I was invited to pray at the beginning of one of those dining ends that Jerry mentioned. And, um, or at a beer and burrito bust or something like that. <laughs> and the beer and burrito bust is really interesting because it's Antonio because um, I knew there'd be a girl showing up without any underclothing on. And you guys said, how do I pray? Or the, in the dying in tradition, there would be a time that the smoking lamp would be lit and there would be a suggestively dressed woman who would be sitting on the lap so all the guys at the front table and until she got to like she said knowing something that's going to happen later in the dinner what do you pray for you know and how do you try to bring them together do they sense a purpose in what they're about and who they are without sounding too preachy because they sound too preachy you won't be asked again because uh, the commander doesn't want to get okay, people divided. okay so my suggestion is you write that prayer <laughs> <laughs> and let them for their first time pick something a little less I think they're ready for the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're ready. <laughs> okay, Ted, you're on. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so take some time, please. You should have pens on your table. And um, I have to return these pens to Heidi, so please leave them on your table.